cost of discipleship, and kind of, you know, the song, I have decided to follow Jesus, right? We've decided all to follow Jesus, I pray in this room. And if we have, we have to understand as Jesus is going to speak to us about the cost. What it costs to be a disciple, meaning under the discipline, the teachings of the master teacher. So again, I want to welcome you to Calvary Chapel. If this is your first time here, welcome. If not, welcome back. It's great to have you here worshiping and reading the Word of God together. Well, like I said, we are picking up in chapter 14 of Luke, verse 25. We, we kind of follow on the heels right now of Jesus who is um, teaching and follows a meal that he was asked to participate in and be in. And I think I have some more sound issues going. Um, and he was uh, invited by a high-ranking religious leader. And uh, wouldn't you know it, there was a man there who was, had dropsy. And now if you look at it today, it's translated as edema, which is just a, an inordinate amount of our body tissues just, uh, just retaining water, water, water. And we look, those folks that have edema, have an edema, they, they look very puffy and, and it's because of the water retention. But Jesus... You know, as some commentators say, he was planted there by the religious leaders. Others say he was part of the group. But be that as it may, whichever the story is, whichever that is, whichever side you fall on, um, the fact of the matter is, is that Jesus always sees the greatest need in the room. I really believe that. And they knew that, those leaders there. And this man with dropsy, he needed a healing the leaders knew that Jesus would have to make a decision. Am I going to heal this need? Am I going to meet this need of this man or not? And they knew what Jesus was all about, knowing his track record. And they said, hey, he's got to make a decision one way or the other. Either heal him or not heal him. Well, what do you all think Jesus does? Well, he heals him, doesn't he? The leaders do this, in my opinion, is that they do this to, to trap him, to trip him up. As the, the history, as we see the Pharisees and, and, the, and the scribes, they're always trying to trap Jesus. They're always trying to, to trip Jesus up and catch him in his words. And so what happens is, is he heals this man, and it's the issue of the Sabbath, doing a healing on the Sabbath day. And we know what the religious leaders were all about in keeping the law for um, their own animals, but not for a man or a woman in need. Kind of interesting, I think. You know, there, there are the leaders that are left there at that dinner, in that place, and Jesus, in his word, rebukes them. He rebukes them for their hypocrisy. He rebukes them for saying, you know what, you, you, will, you will take one of your oxen out of a ditch on the Sabbath, but you won't minister to the need of a fellow man or a fellow woman. It's, it's quite contrary. And, and, he, and he comes down on them. He rebukes them for their hypocrisy in distorting the law of Moses and in that case putting animals in higher esteem before their own fellow man. Then Jesus proceeds to tell them about the future and the future, he gives them this parable about a great feast. And we talked in detail last week about this great feast and what he's meaning in the sense of that Jesus came to minister to his people. He came to minister to the Jewish people, but they refused to believe. They did not want anything with him. So, like the man, the host who invites everyone to this great feast, these special people, they refuse him. And they come up with a bunch of lame excuses, you know. One is, hey, I haven't seen the land but, that I bought already, but now I must go and survey the land that I haven't seen that I bought. None of us would do that. Or, I've got five oxen that I need to test out that I've purchased, he says, as one man says. And it's like, well, gee, who would either test a car or buy a car without test driving it first, right? Kind of the same thing. 
The third lame excuse is one to where it has to do with, with family or with this man and his married wife. When they certainly received the invitation initially, he knew that he was going to be married at a certain time and, and everything. But then here comes, it's like, sorry, I, 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 I've just been married and so therefore I, I cannot go. So Jesus hits those three areas of hypocrisy and then... He leaves the setting. And that's where we're at now. That's where we pick it up now in verse 25 of Luke. So as I read along, please follow with me. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. We'd love to have you use a Bible um, this morning. And um, if not, scoot up to someone next to you. Let's begin at verse 25. Now great multitudes went with him. Now great, I'm sorry, now great multitudes went with him, and he turned and said to them, verse 26, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, that's kind of an underlined highlight word or phrase, he cannot be my disciple. It's interesting as Jesus is leaving the scene of the dinner and then all of a sudden there's a great multitude following him. There's a great multitude behind him and it tells us that he turns and speaks to them now. So he knows they're following him and he turns around and he speaks to them and he gives them a most radical statement. I think it's even a radical statement for today's Christianity as well, not just then. Where Jesus then says, hey, listen, if in fact you come to me and you do not hate your father, your mother, your wife, your children, brothers and sisters, and yes, even your own life, well, you cannot be my disciple. Very radical words that Jesus is using to this multitude, and I think it's radical for today as well. Well, one of these things I want you to know is that regardless of the amount of people, Jesus is never impressed by the crowds. He's never impressed if he ministers to one lame person or one person that needs a healing, like this man with dropsy, or whether he's on the Sermon of the Mount, teaching and preaching and healing. He knows large groups. He knows this large group like any other large group, is following him for reasons, different reasons. And I think that's within the body of Christ as well. Why do you follow Jesus? Is it because he has saved you? Is it because your mom and dad tell you to follow Jesus? Is it because your wife or your husband follow Jesus, and so therefore you're going to follow Jesus because they do and you don't want to make waves within your home? Why do you follow Jesus? Jesus knows the heart of the multitudes because there's three different groups, if you're taking notes, that I believe are within any kind of a group. The first is those that are committed to Him. Those within the group that are committed to Jesus, that are following Him based on a commitment that they've made because they believe Him, and of course they are saved. The other individuals within the group is the, well, the excitement factor. Gee, I wonder what Jesus is going to do today. I wonder what miracle He's going to to wow us with this morning as as we follow Him. Is he going to raise someone from the dead? Is he going to miraculously make someone who cannot see or speak or hear all of a sudden see, speak, and hear? Is he going to make someone who has been a leper for their whole lives or lame for their whole lives be healed and or walk? What reason? What excitement? And unfortunately, a lot of folks come to church for the same reason. They want to be excited. They want to be wowed. They want to leave with an exuberance in them. Now, I understand that we should come to church and we should be excited about the things of God. We should desire to come to His table hungry and saying, I need some food. I'm hungry. I'm thirsty. And 
My life has been just this way and that way. And man, I'm just like not knowing what's going on. And I need to be nourished. I need to be filled up. And then you walk away going, man, Jesus, you met my need, just like the man at the dinner. Well, some folks just came for the excitement factor. The third is the kingdom factor, I would call it. Because remember, there were many who believed, even the apostles, who were continuing to wait and say, hey, Jesus, when are we going to overthrow Rome? When are we going to take over, man? Because you're the Messiah. You're the conqueror. So those who believed him and were following him are saying, I'm waiting. We're waiting now for you to just kind of just lay the hammer down, Jesus. Let's kind of take care of business finally. That, that's what they're saying. That's the other group. Well, he turns around and he gives them this incredible statement that I believe rattles some and encourages others. He proceeds to tell them what is required of them. What's required of them and what is required to be a follower of Him. Interesting. What's required? What Jesus requires of you and me as a follower, and to follow him. Jesus says, when he speaks, I love the way the Lord speaks. He just turns to the crowd and he says, hey, you know what? I, if you don't hate your, your mother, your father, your brothers, your sisters, your, your this, your wife, your husband, or even if you, 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 you cherish your life more than me, you cannot be a disciple. He rattles some people's cages. But Jesus, our sweet Jesus, He doesn't do it with malice. He doesn't do it with guilt or condemnation. But Jesus always looks at the multitude and He sees the hurting hearts. He sees the messed up marriages. He sees the messed up relationships. He sees the finances that are messed up in our lives. He sees the mistakes that we've made in our lives that's brought us to this point. He sees that you and I possibly are not walking so rightly with Him. And He then brings this radical statement and says to us, you must hate those things more to be my disciple. To be, my, to be a follower of me, you must hate them. Not with guilt, not with condemnation, but I believe he does it with compassion because Jesus came to save the lost. Did he not, church? He came to save and take away the bonds and the shackles that hold hold us here by the things of this world. He came to tell the truth. Sometimes, even we who love Jesus, we don't want to hear the truth, do we? When Jesus speaks into our lives about being obedient, when Jesus speaks into our lives and said we must exhibit grace and love and mercy, and understanding and compassion, those things, I think, are very radical for you and me too because those things go fully against who we are. We're selfish. We're ambitious. We're self-sufficient. We're self-centered. And everything that is of Jesus is the antithesis of those things, the opposite of those things. So it's radical then and it's radical now. And I can appreciate the Lord, and I think you can too, when He speaks to you in the quietness of your heart. And then He like, ah, convicts you. 
I'm sure there are things that no different from me that you have said or done or acted out on that you're like, you're not too proud of. It's not something you'd maybe even post on Facebook or tweet something, right? It's that bad. But Jesus knows. See, Jesus knows and he comes to you and he speaks to you as if you read his word or if you're sensitive to the calling of his Holy Spirit, he speaks to you and you just kind of go, ah, yeah, Lord. Yeah, Lord, I, 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 I hear you. He doesn't guilt you out. He doesn't condemn you. But he pours his grace on you because he loves you. You see, that's, that's our Jesus. That's your Jesus. And I think we can appreciate so much. If you don't, you should. You should appreciate this quality about our Lord. You see, Jesus doesn't really unveil, unveil his expectation of our discipleship. Doesn't do it layer by layer, like an onion, right? It's like, oh, well, well, you know, you've come to me now. Oh, well, we won't get to that part yet. No, but what we're going to do is we're going to wait, and then we're going to unveil that. Oh, oh, then we're going to be patient with you, and then, okay, when you're ready, when you're, then we're going to unfold the other one. No, he really doesn't do things layer by layer. This statement is pretty much a good example of that. But Jesus gives us all the large print and gives us all the fine detail in our agreement with agreeing upon his terms right up front. Does he not? I mean, right up front. He's like, this is, this is the relationship that you have entered in with me. These are my requirements, my expectations, my desire for your life. And it grates against us because we're not willing to give up those things. We're not willing to lay down our pride. We're not willing to lay down the things that we have built so much for in our lives and we've strived for so much in our lives and we're not willing to lay them down at the feet of Jesus and say, Lord, I am yours. But Jesus gives us his agreement right up front. You and I can never say when we come to the Lord, oh, I didn't know that. Oh, I didn't expect that. Oh, oh, I didn't sign up for, for this. Oh, you know, those kinds of statements. As I said, a disciple, this speaks to us in verse 26, is someone who wants to be like the one they follow. Think about that. A disciple is someone who wants to be like the one they follow. Who do you follow? Do you follow Bill Gates or the late uh, Steve Jobs who was head of Apple? Do you follow them? Do you follow the, the, the guy on Wall Street who's making the biggest, you know, leverage buyouts and those types of things? Do you follow the greatest trend, the latest trend, the this, the that? Is that the things that you follow? Because what you follow is what you're trying to be like. If you are following Christ, then you and I should be looking more like Him. In all of our lives, inside and outside the demonstration of things in our lives. People follow who they want to be like. That's how I want to live. We look at Jesus and say, that's how I want to live. We look at Jesus and say, that's how I want to speak. We look at Jesus and we say, that's how I want to think. This is how I want my life patterned after. The Apostle Paul talks about the patterns of our lives. And that our lives are to be patterned after Christ. So Jesus tells everyone 
everyone there before him in this crowd, what is required of a disciple? What is required of a disciple? And anyone who wants to follow him. Get this. This is really cool, I think. This is really cool as Jesus turns around and makes this radical statement. He says, in order for this to be a disciple, this needs to happen, that needs to happen, and that needs to happen. Well, in verse 26, he's not being all mean. And man, what's Jesus, what's his problem? Why is he so mean? Why, why isn't he, where's the compassion, Lord? That word hate isn't what we would think it would be in our own language. It's loving less, but it's loving less in comparison. That's what we're looking at here, a comparative statement these things to being a disciple of Jesus. He says, listen, I know there are things in your life that you love, and that's okay. I'm not asking you to give them up. I'm just saying you need to love them less. You need to put me, he says, in the top spot. And those things, lower. But our problems are is that we do put those things above Jesus. That's the problem. And so Jesus says, listen, you can love things. Love your family. Of course, he's not saying... Because, you know, if in fact he was saying, hate your mother, hate your father, hate your children, hate this. Hey, doesn't he go against his own commandments? Remember, Jesus never contradicts himself. So he's not speaking about hatred and being against. He's saying, listen, love them less than me. That I should be preeminent in your life. Me and me alone. Even your own life. Oh, how many of you love your lives? Yeah. Oh, not a lot of you, I guess. Okay, cool. You're sold out for Jesus. But we love our lives, don't we? We want to remain living, don't we? Jesus says, listen, even love your life less than you love me. You see, it's not hatred. He would be violating his own teachings if it was about hate. Jesus said, love the Lord your God. And love others as yourself. Instead, he's speaking of priority. He's speaking of preeminence that Jesus must. I'm not saying should. I'm saying must have in your life. There is no other way, Christians, to be called a disciple of Christ if you're putting everything else in preeminence above him do you see these are the words of our lord this is what he is saying this is his standard his requirement you and i are to have an incredible loyalty to jesus over and above everything else even to family even to life itself let me share this with you even if a family member tells you to choose between them and Jesus, guess what your choice should be? Jesus. That's where it must be. Jesus. Because Jesus says, love them less. Man, when you and I become a Christian, it's like there is so much room for love. So much room for love. If it comes down to obeying others or obeying Jesus, obey Jesus. Obedience to Jesus is to be the foremost thing in our lives. Many times we have to act in obedience first before we are even blessed. Many times we're to act in obedience to the Scriptures before before we want to do it or before we feel like doing it we 
we are to walk in obedience. How many of you can remember doing something that you did not want to do, yet you knew you had to do it? Maybe getting up for work every day. But you have to do it, do you not? You have to go to the office. You have to go deal with people. You have to, oh my goodness, I can remember my boys. I was so happy when they got out of high school, or when they started driving. It was like, yes, no more getting up at 5.30 in the morning and taking them to school and all this stuff. Wow, what a blessing that was. But I had to do it. My wife, Jean, we had to do it. Obedience. Obedience. So our love for him, Jesus says, must be greater than any other relationship in life. What is it you love? What is it you put in priority? It may not be a person. It may be a thing. It may be an object. It may even be an aspiration. Well, you being a child of Christ knows that God will give you the desires of your heart according to his own will. So you trust and you wait and you say, Lord, you know, I want to reflect you. Last night at Acquire the Fire, man, they were telling the, 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 the students there, listen, yeah, you go into the movie industry, you go into the recording industry, you go into this industry or that industry, but you do it to glorify Jesus, not yourself. That's what you do. God has given you and I giftings and talents and abilities, not for you, but for Him. If I had more time, I'd tell you a really cool story about a young man who, well, I'll tell you really quick, okay, because it's really good. A young guy, okay, young Jewish guy, messianic young man. He, he, his father, in fact, his father's taught here, Sam Nadler, and Sam's son was, uh, went to VCU and went to the film and media and all that kind of stuff, and he wanted to make movies, and of course his father's like, yeah, okay, he's going to do the video thing and this and that, and that's cool, that's cool, but then his son got the job in Hollywood. And all of a sudden, oy vey, you know, the job is in Hollywood. Oh no, we're going to lose our son to everything that goes into, into Hollywood. Well, he starts working for Sony Pictures, and in Sony Pictures, they acquired a division, a division that distributes and edits and pro does all that stuff for Christian movies because they see, hey, guess what? Christian movies are a big seller. People go, wow, who'd have thought it? Well, the executives at Sony don't know what to do. What's this Christian movie thing about? What do we do? How do we edit it? What does all this stuff mean? We need a Christian guy. We need somebody who kind of understands this whole Christian thing. This young man happens to be working there. there is, it's known that he's a Christian within his unit, within his division or whatever it is, and they think of him right away. Hey, how about you? You're a Christian. You must know these things about God and Jesus, all that kind of stuff. Would you be the editor of the films? Would you make the decision on what ends up on the editing room floor and what is shown to people? Because, you know, we don't frankly know what we're doing. Well, of course I will, he said. He jumped at the chance. And you've already seen his work in uh, Facing the Giants. And you've already seen his work in uh, the most recent film, um, uh, Courageous, and then then Fireproof and, and different Christian movies where his name is there. So you see, whatever you do, it is not impossible to do it for the glory of God. And did not God elevate this young man? Huh? Isn't that great? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Look, you see, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to promote your Christianity within your workplace. Don't be afraid to declare who Jesus is in your life. Don't be afraid because God will honor it. He will honor it. Well, let's kind of get back on track. So our lives, your life, my life, it must be greater than any other thing, including relationships. Relationships. Relationships in Christ, stay with me, 
should never suffer because of Jesus. I'm going to say that again. Relationships in Christ should never suffer because Jesus is now in the picture. Do you follow me? Your relationship with your wife or with your husband or with your children should never suffer because of Jesus. But you have to love those family members if you love Jesus because He commands you to. Does He not? He says love one another. Another thing is that Jesus did say from the Old Testament law, you know, love me first. And he says also that since he's the only one that can really declare this, he had the ability to do this. Some people think that to love Jesus is to the exclusion of of everything else. You know, and sometimes I, I, I've, got to, I, I've got to caveat this with like, you know, understand loving Jesus is the main thing. But, but loving Jesus so much more doesn't mean you love your family so much less. Because Jesus gives you the ability to love your family. He, he, he loves your family. You love your family. And when Jesus is brought into the picture, hey, I'm not saying it's going to be easy. If you've had a family that has been not living in the things of God and then the husband or the wife come to or both come to salvation, guess what? There's going to be tenseness going on. But there's, the love is still there. You see, for an example, husband or wife, they begin following the Lord with such an incredible fever they just love, or I should say, fervor. They're excited. Man, they're following Jesus, going to Bible study. They're, they're talking to people. Every, they've got, they're carrying their Bibles with them, which is something that you may never have seen. And usually what happens is one spouse then gets left out. And then resentment and bitterness sets in. This is only because the other one is not loving Jesus preeminently. You see, there has to be a preeminence within the family to love Jesus. The father, the mother, the husband, the wife. They both are to be following and loving Jesus with all their heart, soul, mind and strength. And if there's strife, if there's something going on, well, that just means that one, the, one of them the mom or the dad is not putting Jesus first in his commands and what he wants for their lives, A number one. You see, your love and my love for Jesus Christ must be so incredibly complete. It must be so full that our love for our family and for life itself will pale compared to Jesus see my wife and I made a decision long time ago that we would put Jesus first in our lives long time ago ahead of our marriage ahead of our relationship ahead of our children now you can say well gee it's easy for you pastor Tom because you're a pastor I wasn't always a pastor but I was just a Christian businessman Loving the Lord and serving Him and operating my business as according to what He wants for my business and what He wanted for my family. And we made a decision a long time ago as for our house, we will serve the Lord. As for our house, we will put Jesus number one. You see, if you have not, husbands and wives, Mom or dad made that decision in your family. There will be problems. You know, you and I cannot be a casual disciple. If your desire in living for God 
Is it truly wholehearted? There's tough things to follow Jesus. He's going to ask you to do some tough things. Not easy. But do you believe God? We studied the last two chapters of Jonah on Thursday night with the men. And when the Ninevites, oh, you know about the Ninevites, right? Woo, they would lead their captives by fish hooks to Nineveh. They would skin their captives alive. They would impale them on a stake to their brains. Those were the Ninevites, guys. And if you know the story of Jonah, God saved that town. Over 120,000 were saved. And you can't love the neighbor whose dog happens to like mess on your lawn? We got to bring it in perspective, right? Man, you can look at Jonah and say, God is so merciful. God gives so much grace. And why do you think Jonah had such a hard time? Jonah had to make a very difficult choice. Serve God or leave. Serve God or leave. Serve God or leave. And we know what happened when he left. Do we not? Bleached white. No hair. Vomited up on the beach in Nineveh. Three days in the belly of a great fish. Thinking about how did I get here? It may come for you and for me at times in our lives to make hard choices because Jesus will not take anything less than first place in your life. He really won't. You need to honor Jesus. Follow Jesus. Live by His commands. Because you know what, guys? Why don't we? Why don't we live by His commands? Why why don't we get it that He loves us so much? Why don't we understand it in our minds that, man, oh, Jesus is in my heart, but is he in your mind as well? When you see the wonderful things he's done for you already and he's he's blessed you and he's loved you and he's given you grace and he's given you mercy and look at your children and look at the blessings and all of these things, can you not say when God asks you to do something tough, can you not say, Lord, I know, I know, how you've been in the past, that makes me be able to look to the future to what you're going to do. So therefore, I believe you. See, that was my point. Ooh, now I remember with the Ninevites and Jonah. You see, they, the Ninevites, believed God. That's what, that's what the scripture says. Not believed in God. How many of you here this morning, show me your hands, believe in God? Oh, I believe in God. Yeah. Yeah. Great. We're tracking so far. Now, let me ask you the other question. How many of you believe God? Believe Him. His Word, oh man, I could say, are truly like the psalmist says. It speaks about us, but, you know, our our apples of of, um, gold upon settings of silver. For you and for me. Because he loves us. He loves you. So he would never have you do something that's going to be detrimental. But like Jonah too, hey, there was comfort of that little bitty tree, huh? Boop. Till the Lord sent a wormwood. And then that's where it showed that God wanted to do something with Jonah. There was the comfort of the tree, but then also once the tree was gone. Remember, the scripture in there in Jonah says that God prepared a tree. God prepared a worm. He prepared both. He also prepared a very scorching east wind. It all came from God. Jonah couldn't say, oh, Satan's on my back. Oh, the devil's really at my heels today, man. It was all from God. 
One is for comfort. Yes, the blessings are wonderful, but what about when the tough times come? And God allows that worm to eat away that tree. Whatever that tree is, he allows to eat it. And then, do you believe God? Do you believe him? That he loves you? He's your provider? He's your sustainer? Oh. You will have to decide at one point in your life. You will. To what are you really devoted to? To what? And then, to whom are you really devoted or loyal to? Two simple questions that can change the course of your life. In verse 27, And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple, he says. Jesus speaks so clearly to those around him in the previous statement and in this statement. They who were present knew exactly what he meant. Jesus knew what he meant. They were all under the Roman Empire. Cross was an instrument of death. To you and me today, it does mean something different because of what Jesus did on the cross. So Jesus says to bear your cross, he means that you are going to carry the cross of being submitted to him. Because when an individual that was sentenced to die on the cross carried that cross through the town, everyone knew right away, ooh, I'm not doing what he did. It was a message, number one. But number two, it showed who was boss. Who was the ruler? Who was in charge? Rome. Because that person now was submitted to Rome, carrying that cross through the town. That's why Jesus carried the cross, the Via Della Rosa, up to Calvary, because they sent a message to those around, do not be like him, because this is how you're going to end up. He's ultimately submitted to our authority, our rule, and that's why he's carrying this cross. You see, Jesus, in making this statement, says, if you don't bear my cross and come after me, you cannot be my disciple. Meaning, under his rule, under his reign, you and I are to live fully and wholeheartedly submitted to the cross of Christ. And you're to publicly declare it. Carry your cross. For goodness sakes, let people know that you're Christians. Carry that cross of Christ. Let people know and see that you are submitted to someone greater than you are, to yourself. Let people see Christ in your life. Even in the good times, it's easy to bless Jesus. But it's more difficult in the tough times. It's easy to obey Jesus when things are going, man, great. The bank account's high. Everything's happening really good. Oh, Lord, I love you. But in the times of trial, when you can go back to the Word of God, because it's all about the Word of God, and it's that Word that is going to sustain you, because that's where His promises lie, and if you believe God, you will live and walk by His promises, even in the tough times. So you as children of God, here this morning, I encourage you to publicly declare and carry the cross of Christ. There should not be any mystery about who you are. There should be no mystery on who you follow. There should be no mystery on who you are subjected to, who you are submitted to. There should be no mystery. To be a disciple of Jesus Christ. I'll ask you a question. Is there something more important to you? Something, someone more important to you than Jesus? One thing I love about Jesus, and maybe you haven't picked up on it, I'm sure you have though, is that Jesus, when he says this to people, does he like hang around and wait for them to go, oh, what do you mean? 
Uh, what exactly are you talking about, Jesus? Uh, uh, we don't get it. Um, um, uh, you know, I, I don't, Jesus just says what he says. And he continues walking. <laughs> I love it. He says what he says and continues walking. He doesn't hold their hand. Oh, I know, I know. I know you don't understand. Let me explain it to you, please, one more time. No. He says what he says, and he continues walking. I love that. He doesn't wait for an emotional commitment to follow him or some response. He wants your decision to be lucid. He wants your decision to be clear, sober-minded, clear thinking. And that way, you'll know what you signed up for. <laughs> you'll know what you signed up for. Because you'll have had a clear mind. Jesus states it, and you have a choice. Believe it or not. Follow him or not. Because Jesus is still walking down the street. Jesus is encouraging those within this multitude. Because remember, we're not talking about apostles. We're not talking about disciples. We're talking about multitudes here, the crowd. He encourages those in the crowd who were possibly superficial either to go, go deeper, go deeper, or turn back. That's what he's saying. Because following Jesus does mean total submission. Even, he says, to the point of death. 28 through 30, he says, For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit first to count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it? Lest after he has held the foundation and is not able to finish it, and all who see it begin to mock him saying this man began to build and was not able to finish. So we know the story. A guy wants to build a tower, and he doesn't really figure out the, the numbers quite enough, doesn't crunch them closely enough, and then what happens? Halfway through, oh, ran out of money. What happens? I, I don't know what happened here. He gives us one of two examples, this one with a tower. The other one is a king who declares to go to war. The builder who wants to build a tower or a house or anything like that, any builder knows the cost to build the house. It does no good to start a job and not be able to finish it. It really doesn't. Jesus is saying the same thing when you make a commitment to him. It does no good to be, oh, yes, man, I'm charged up, I'm fired up for Jesus, and then all of a sudden, halfway through, you quit because it got too tough. You just give up. You walk away. Jesus is saying the same thing. Be clear, be lucid, be understanding about the decision that you're making for me. Be, be understanding of that. And so therefore, because he wants you to be so clear thinking and clear minded, then, then he says also, you need to count the cost of what, I'm, of what my standard is, of what I want is. You have to count the cost. Because you don't want to be in this and then all of a sudden quit halfway through and walk away. This is usually when we call people just leave or they backslide when things get tough and, and then they forget about following Jesus. Um, they forget that they may think that following Jesus all their troubles are going to go away. All people, everyone, I believe, are to carefully count the cost of becoming a disciple of Jesus. Luke writes this in Acts 20, 24. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I have received from the Lord Jesus to testify of the gospel of the grace of God. In verse 30, it says, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. It may be tough, but you're not doing it in vain. Paul encourages Timothy in 4.7. Uh, uh, 4, he says, I have, I have fought the good fight. I, I have finished the race, he says of himself. I have kept the faith. See, that's what we want to say at the very end. We didn't quit halfway through. Sure, it's tough. You think your pastor hasn't had any setbacks in his life? 
Has it anything to deal with issues? You can't give up. 31 and 32, he speaks about a king, a king that wants to go to war. And he finds out that this, the, the, the opposition has more than what he does. So uh, the scripture, Jesus is saying, so, so in, in verse 33, he says, so likewise, or I'm sorry, 32, or else while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for a condition of peace. He kind of sees, hey, you know what? The odds are so stacked against me. I can't enter into war, battle like this. He's counting the cost. So Jesus says in 33, whoever of you does not forsake all that, is, all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. He says it again. Have you made a decision to follow Jesus, to trust him for your salvation? Simple question, simple, simple question. And if so, have you been able to pay attention to your devotion to him and being a disciple of him? Have you paid attention to that and kind of examined yourself and say, man, Lord, am I a good follower of yours? I know I'm not perfect, but am I a good follower? Am I trying to do the things you want me to do? Am I wanting to hear from your Holy Spirit? Am I excited to read your word? Am I gleaning from it? Am I, am I loving others? Am I patient with others? Am I just taking an evaluation of yourself? A decision to trust Jesus means that he is Lord and Savior over your life. So therefore, you're to listen to him, you're to follow him, and you're to heed him. To wade in the quietness of the water on the shore and just drift in your Christian life is no decision at all. If you trust Jesus, then show you mean it by following what he asks of you. By following his example. In closing, 34 and 35, He speaks about something we all know about, salt. He says, whoever you does not, or I'm sorry, he says, salt is good, but if salt has lost its favor, how shall it be seasoned? It's neither fit for the land or the dunghill, but men throw it out. And he who has ears, he says, listen up. If you've got ears, then hear me. You can hear me. It's interesting. Salt has been used for seasoning for so many centuries as a preservative, as a seasoning. And then there was such a thing as impure salt, salt that we be thrown along the wayside to, to kill weeds or thrown on the road to clear the road, just to keep the weeds down off the road. They did that a lot. Jesus asks the question in these two verses, though. He's asking the question, I believe, how can saltiness be restored? How can it be restored? Because he says, hey, salt is good, but if it's lost its flavor. So the question is, well, how does it become restored? Does salt actually become restored? Can its flavor become restored? Well, I don't know the answer to that, frankly. It was a good question, but I don't have the answer. It's probably a pretty rhetorical question. He didn't expect an answer to to come back to him. Because really, when you think about it, when salt is gone, it just what? leaves a residue. That's really all salt does. It leaves a residue once it's gone. We can't, you can't, I can't as Christians. In this saltiness, God has called you to be light and salt. Season the world by your life. You see, and if you are a disciple of Jesus, you will do that. You understand? You will do that. People will look and say, man, I remember you were going through this tough time, but oh my gosh, we prayed for you. You were praying as a family. We saw you fully just being obedient to the word of God. We saw that in your life. And man, you have encouraged me because guess what? I'm kind of going through the same thing. 
I'm kind of at the same spot you were at this time. I'm here now. And it's like, oh, I'm so encouraged though. I'm so encouraged because I saw what you did. I saw you hang in there. I saw you just hang tight and be steadfast and go, man, oh, you believed in God or you believed God for his word and I saw that shown in your life and I was so blessed for it. Man, brother, I never told you that, but you encouraged me greatly. That's being really salty. That's adding to someone's life. A seasoning, something special. Well, we have to be standing up for Jesus. We can't, as Christians, blend into the world. Woo, just blend into the world. If we do, then I believe when Jesus speaks about how does salt lose its flavor, that's what you do. You see, when you blend into the world, you, you reduce the saltiness of who you are in Christ. It's reduced. It's like having a water filled with, or having a glass filled with salt, and you decide to pour water in it and water in it to where pretty soon it's just, it's cloudy. Was that salt or is that just really bad Williamsburg water? What is it, man? I don't know. No, Williamsburg has really good water, by the way. But it's like, you know, what is that? California water? I'll tell you about that later. But it's like too cloudy. What was in this glass? It's not even reminiscent of anything. So, you know, blending in, becoming diluted by the things of the world, that's what Jesus is talking about. So he's encouraging us, listen, if you're going to be a disciple, because remember the context of the scripture is, hey, hey, to be my disciple under my teaching if you want to follow me that means you want to be like me if you want to be like me then you're going to be salty you're going to be seasoning those around you a little sprinkle here a little sprinkle there a little sprinkle there they see your lives the testimony of your walk and they're like blessed by it or maybe you have an ability to be able to bless others financially or by through helps or whatever it might be man remain salty then Jesus says, hey, if you've got ears, check. If you've got ears, he says, hear up. Listen up. His words are true. The cost of discipleship, guys. Oh, my goodness. I cannot tell you that my Christian walk has been so easy. Because it hasn't. But I truly find joy in my walk. God has blessed, but God has also prepared worms at times because I know the blessings of his comfort, but I also know the, 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 the things that he wants me to learn and he wants me to grow into. And those things many times are called trials. Don't give up. Be steadfast. Be immovable. Even when that trial comes by. Hey, it's not always from Satan, is it? Sometimes the Lord is like, you know what? It's time to graduate, kids. It's time to graduate. Getting out of the preschool of Christianity and getting into elementary school or elementary to middle school or middle school to high school or college or even, ooh, a graduate course. Man, it takes, a, it takes a while sometimes, but it definitely always does not come easy. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word. And I thank you for these lovely people here, Lord. Your precious people. Who, no different than myself, Lord, try to do the right thing. Try to live according to your commandments. Want others to see you shown outwardly in our lives, God. God, I pray, I pray, Lord, that they will truly decide to follow you, Lord, because you love them so incredibly much. You have such an incredible future for everyone in this room if they decide to make you king of their lives. If they will just bring their lives under you, oh, Lord, 
Oh, Lord, they will be so blessed. And so, God, today, I, I pray, Lord, that as we're encouraged by you, Lord, that compared to you, there is nothing. There is nothing. May we never forget that. May we never forget the reading of your word. Your word is life. Your word is truth. Your word sustains us, Lord. When the east winds come, when the shade is gone, Lord, for any of us here, help our unbelief. Help our unbelief, Lord, because it isn't easy. Lord, strengthen your children here in this place. Strengthen them, God. May they desire to follow after you, their teacher, their savior. We love you, Lord. We thank you. And it's in Jesus' name we all can say, Amen. Amen.